Well, that's good. It gives me time to set up, Tom. Me too. If you have a question, if you'll line up here, right here, just line right here behind this table. Andrew, if you'll take this microphone from its stand, and if you and Anthony okay, will stand right in here. See if yep, I've got a live mic here. Terry, if you come on down, we'll have our first question. Terry, go right ahead. Who would this, who would this question? Terry, go right ahead. Who would this, who would this question for? Actually, this is for Anthony. Okay. Thank you. I um, did a word study on. Actually, it was Ad and I, and I remember y'all were talking about Psalms one ten. Yes. And it's actually kind of a big question because <clears throat> how, how do you explain the plurality? And, and the first time the word master or add-on was used is in Genesis, um, somewhere around 15 or 24, where they went to go find a, um, <clears throat> a wife for Isaac. And he referred to Abraham as his master, Adon. And then Adonai, which is a plural form, which which what I read from gave it a Didi name. And um, also Elohim, Allah meaning God, and Him is a plural form. So how do you explain these plural forms of the word Adonai? And also in Psalms 110, how do you explain the two capital Y's? Um, I cornered my wife and said, if this was just a man, like you were the landowner, or I was a landowner, and somebody said, my Lord, um, that were, even if he was like a prince, that would not be capitalized. That should have been lowercase. So, and, and there's two, there's, that's kind of a two way question. Go ahead, Anthony, and yeah. you can respond after he gets done. Yeah, thank you. Just, just give you some data, if I may. I don't is used of God and man, both, both, Adon, Adon, Adoni is the word in Psalm 110, one. should not have a capital, look at your RSP, look at your JPS, should not be capitalized, that's a tendentious capitalized, the word is not Adonai, the word is Adoni, never used of God, always used of men. The one in Genesis, I, I would have to look at the text, you have Adoni, my Lord, my Master, my Husband, but you'll just have to look at the statistics. We've had people check this out, you know, on the internet. You'll find it just to stand. So uh, it's, it's only a question of looking at the Hebrew. Can you read the Hebrew? No, I haven't read the Hebrew, but I've read the Hebrew. They were talking about master, and it says master instead of Lord. Yes. And the word is Adoni there. The word is Adoni, or possibly Adon, but not Adonai, which is only for God. It's a, it's a little technical, but. I can only ask you to look a little further. I can look at the text after, after with you, if you like. We could do that. It's a great question. And, and, and the, you haven't finished with the plurality? Oh, the pr plurality of Elohim. Well, Elohim is... Uh, Messiah is also Elohim. Is he plural? Thy throne, O God, in Psalm 45. The Messiah is Elohim. What about the singular gods of, of the pagans? Chemosh and, uh, and, and the others, Astarte, they're all Elohim. So that's a plural of majesty. Why does God say, who, that I, if I'm a master, if I'm a master's, he says, this is a plural of majesty, it's a language trick, like news in English has an S, but it doesn't mean plural. You just have to look at the, the commentaries. N most translations would not use that argument, by the way, today, they won't use that anymore. That's an old one. Well, that's okay, you took a little extra time, because I think that was three questions. <laughs> so, and three answers are necessary. So go ahead, Drew, with, with a brief response. Well, I would, I would just say that, again, you would have to accept the uh, vocalization of the Masoretic text. When the Hebrew was at, originally written, it wouldn't have appeared as it does now. And to be dogmatic on it, saying that this somehow proves that Jesus isn't God, I think, is just really an untenable position. Um, 
that's really all I have to say. All right, thank you, Drew. We have a second question, and this is for who? This is, uh, well, I was debating here, <laughs> and I would love to hear what both of you have to say. And I'll just say, I'll put this out to, to Drew for the first thing. I have okay. two questions here. Drew, who, um, actually, I mean, uh, John 1 1, this is your. Uh, a major verse that that is that I used to overlook until dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, especially, and all of a sudden it dawned on me what this means. And Anthony, you'll, because you'll be answering to this, you said the word should not be capitalized. It wasn't capitalized, I don't think, in the Greek. But anyway, um, you didn't you didn't mention verse two. It said he is he not in the Greek? Um, is it not in the Greek? Because I didn't know that if it wasn't. Um, it. I mean, go ahead. You go ahead and answer that. I'll... Okay, if I remember right, the text is out, reads uh, altas. Um, I would understand that as a he. Uh, what, what, what we're really determining, though, in John 1 1 is is the word personal or is it impersonal, as Anthony is saying? Uh, he suggested in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Father, and the Son is the Father. That's not really how it's written in the Greek. Um, I understand the text to be what's called qualitative in its expression in the Greek. Um, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Hatheos. And John 1, 1c does not have the definite article. It's kaitheos halagos. Uh, the Word remains the subject in the Greek there and I understand it qualitative and what that means is the word to its to his nature was divine or deity. Um, that settles the confusion of whether the word was the person whom he was with. He was not the person whom he was with. I agree with Anthony more than likely um Hafeos is the father, but we have a clear distinction between Theos and the Lagos. I think that's very clear. Now, if you want to know if it's personal or impersonal, consider this. In the beginning was a blueprint. The blueprint was with God and God is a blueprint. It doesn't make sense to me. I think it's personal. I think it's properly translated a he. Um, so that's my answer, my brief answer. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, the fact is that aftas in utas is the word here, and then followed by all things are made through him or it. Logos is masculine in Greek. There's no justification for putting a capital letter on there. No capital letters there in the Greek. None. That's why eight English translations properly rendered, and 50 translations since that time. And in 2007, this big scholar in London is talking about plan and it. So there's no justification for saying all things are made through him. None at all. Until you've decided that the word is a person, the son. If you're reading in the beginning it was the son, yes. If you go to Fuller Seminary, the professor is saying, why are people reading son there? It doesn't say son, it says word. Jesus is what the word became. He's not one to unequal the pre-existing son. It's simply a matter of grammar there. Logos is masculine, perfectly valid to say it. Or him, either. But you're going to have to make up your mind. Is this in the beginning with the sun, or is it the word? And yes, I agree, it's, it's qualitative, I like that very much. Theos in logos, theos in logos. The logos was fully expressive of God. It's his wisdom. Jesus is walking wisdom. Doesn't mean he pre-exists as the sun. He's what wisdom became. Not one to one equal. Think about that. Okay, thank you, Anthony. And I think Dave's got a second. Yeah, the um, second one's Philippians. Who's uh, the well, this is for Anthony. This is here is for definitely Anthony. I'm sorry. Um, Philippians chapter. You may have answered this. You know, this is sort of like a blur for us because there's so much. To, and, and you know, I I would love to just sit down with you, Anthony, and just talk. Cause it's just uh, just just sit down and talk because there's so many questions that I I would that there's a lot of things that, that I couldn't take notes on out there. But here, Philippians chapter um, two verses ten, and I'll just start there. That the name and I we we went over this text quite a bit. I could have missed it if I did. I apologize. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Isaiah chapter 45, verses, I believe it's 23. Um, I don't know if you answered this or not, but um, it says, I've sworn by myself. And this in the context, if you look back here, speaking about God, it says, and there is no other God besides me. 
a just God and Savior. There's none besides me. He's saying there's no God beside me here. He's saying there's one God, which I firmly believe in one God here. I have sworn by myself and the word that's going out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. That's what it says in King James. Uh, and then it goes on and it goes right back. It says, I, Yahweh, or surely, it says the next verse here, surely in Yahweh I have righteousness and strength. And he shall say, it says, yeah, it's great. It's a great question. Who is God? At the end of your quote in Philippians, who is said to be God there? In verse 10 or 9. To the glory of what? To the glory of... Every knee shall bow. To the glory of... God the Father. Ah! 1,317 times after the Os means the Father. Clearly. Jesus is as God to you. He's God's representative. He speaks as God. As God's created instrument. Begotten. Of course, he's given the name, the authority, as the angel of the Lord had the name of God in him. Doesn't mean he was God. I can show you the angel of the Lord isn't God. He's distinguished from God. Stephen knew nothing about the angel of the Lord being God. No, no, he said an angel, didn't say Jesus. No, no, the angel had God's name invested in him. You, if Drew sends me out on a job, I am Drew. I want you to tell you this is basic Jewish shaliach understanding. He sends me out on a job, I'm his shaliach, I am Drew. You deal with me, you're dealing with him. That's the key to New Testament Christology, I suggest to you. Okay, I would just respond. Um, <clears throat> again, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. I think is re really the parallel passage you brought up is uh, quite awesome in revealing that every knee is going to bow and confess. My understanding is that Jesus is Yahweh. I think of the game play, that Jesus is Yahweh. I think of the game playing uncle. You ever played uncle? Where somebody just holds you down and tickles you? And they don't give up until you say uncle. Well, I have one son here. His name's Zachariah. He never gives up. He'll just, you tickle, 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 tickle. And finally, he'll say uncle. I believe every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess Jesus is God. Either we can do it now and we can be a part of the heavenly worship in Revelation chapter 5 or we can wait till later and then be, then be cast into outer darkness. Alright, we have another question. Go ahead, Tony. Um, Dave kind of got it here. Uh, well, halfway kind of got it. I just want to comment on what you said about at the end of a uh, second Philippi or uh, Philippians chapter two, verse five through eleven, that's what my whole question is generally based on. But verse eleven, how you said, "God to the glory of God the Father." But if you look right above it, it says, "Christ is Lord," and the Lord, the L in Lord, is capitalized. Now I've seen the word Lord used in the Bible without capitalized, without capitalized letters. I mean, how can this stand? Yeah, capitalization is pure editor, editorizing, editorializing. Right? Forget the capitals. No, no capitals when you're looking at the Greek. Now, forget that. The one in Psalm 110.1 is wrong. There should not be a capital letter there. Why do they put Adoni without a capital 193 times and twice only they put a capital on it? That's not fair. They're not playing fair with the public. Capitals have nothing to do with it. The Lord Messiah is who Jesus is. He's the one Lord Messiah, not the Lord God. I keep hearing He's Yahweh. That's two Yahwehs. One too many. He's the Lord Messiah. I didn't quite get my point over on proskuneo. I just must add this. Jesus is not worshipped as God. He's not La Treva. Sure he's proskuneo. And so are the saints proskuneo. You're worshipped too. The saints are worshipped. So that's the critical distinction. He's the Lord Messiah, the Adoni of Psalm 121. Every time you come to our Lord, my Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, this is exactly Psalm 121, quoted more than any other text from the old in the new. That's why it's so important. And it's reflected in Greek, Kyrios Mu, which translates Adoni, does not translate Adonai. I've shown that in the book. We have absolute corroboration. There's nothing wrong with the vowel points there. No need to fiddle with the vowel points. They're, they're well done, I think. Did I get to your point? I hope I did. Kind of. Yeah, I got it. Drew, do you want to go ahead and handle that? I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the capitals. I, I would just say that there, there's, in the Greek, the, uh, the unsuls were. If you read the Greek, it would all be capitals for the most part, and there's no spaces. And I have a very difficult time reading Greek in that manner. I still like the spaces between the words, 
and so on. So I, I don't think it's really a point. And that really wasn't my question. I was just kind of trying to figure something out there. My my general question to you, Anthony, is uh, I'm not trying to sound rude here. It might come out as rude, but I, just believe me, I'm not trying to be. Now, reading Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11, how can you like kind of justify Unitarianism? I mean, because it says that uh, Jesus, who being in the ver- in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, cool. taking the very nature of a servant. Of course. Notice it doesn't say he was God and became man. He says it was in the form of God and became a servant. Please read James Dunn before you do your homework and finish it the next two years. You've got to read James Dunn and many other scholars. Many have objected to the Trinitarian view here. Right, so in the form of God means in the image of God. Who is he talking about? Messiah Jesus. Messiah Jesus, he says. He, he, that's the, the focus that he's, he's got in mind. Let this mind be in you which was in Messiah Jesus. First Timothy 2.5, he says, the man Messiah Jesus. Paul didn't imagine a pre-existing angel or second member of the Trinity. Talking about the human Jesus. Look at his life. Look how he washed the dishes. And look how he was the very reflection of God. Nothing to do with pre-existence there. I suggest. Became a servant. He's acted like a servant, that's all. Any comment on that, Drew? Yes, it is. Uh, the Greek term there is theumorphe, and I understand that to mean the outward expression of the inner quality. And I think there's plenty of support for that. In other words, he was in the very form of God. He was God. It says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who did not consider it to be robbery or a thing to be grasped after. So to consider, you have to exist. And this all happened before the Incarnation, according to the context. Okay. Thanks. Barry, you have a question? Go right ahead. Who's this for? Uh, this is for Drew. <laughs> yes. Um, I do I say this? Drew, um, I hope the gentleman goes home and does his homework and studies tonight on the word proskuneo that you brought up so uh, nicely there in uh, Revelation. Would you explain that one more time to me, what it says and means there in Revelation, the last chapter about Jesus being worshipped as God? Well, it just appears to me in the context we have the Father. It is mentioned uh, proskuneo, uh, to the, given to the Father. And there's certain words mentioned there, blessing and honor and glory and power and so forth. Those same acts of worship is given to the Lamb as well. And the same words are uttered again to the Lamb and to the one seated on the throne. And then it mentions proskuneo again to the one on the throne. I'm not trying to be so rigid that I have to have the word, the proper word there of true worship. I can look at the action, I can look at the words. There's no doubt that Anthony and I would agree that the Father is being worshipped there, the one seated on the throne. But the same things are being done to the Son as well, and so I don't make a distinction that, well, this must not be true worship. Yes, I think we haven't got the language words quite straight. Proskineo is used of human beings, is it clear? And God. David was worshipped. King James does this well. We don't say that in English, but the King James will show you. The Strong's Concordance will show you. If David is worshipped, was he God? Obviously not. Are, are hymns sung to Jesus? Yes. It doesn't prove he's God. It proves that an exalted human being, the unique one, can have a hymn sung to him. The saints are worshipped. I didn't hear anybody mention that. The saints are proskuneoed in Revelation uh, chapter 3. It's a, a, a thing you said, a flexible word. It proves nothing about the object, not in itself. Now, la trevo is used of worship as only of God. You won't find Jesus being la trevoed. That might be an interesting distinction to think about. All right, we have another question. Chris, well, who do you want this question to be for? Both can respond. <laughs> who first? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Isaiah forty three eleven says, I even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. And out of the book of Matthew one twenty one the angel told uh, Joseph, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. My problem is I'm a sinner and my sin separates me from God. 
I understand what you're saying is that my problem is understanding Greek and Hebrew. If I believe Jesus is God and worship Him as Savior and Lord, am I in sin and going to hell? Well, of course I would say no. I would have to say that God is extraordinarily merciful. How, how He winks at times of ignorance, I don't know. I'll leave that up to Him. I wouldn't condemn you for a moment, nor am I saying you have to do Greek and Hebrew to do this. You can, you can do some research, you can check on the points that I've made, uh, but uh, what was your earlier point? Yes, he's a saviour. Is he the only saviour in the Bible? No, there are saviours in the book of Judges too, but they're not the saviour that you're talking about. If God appoints a sinless, virtually begotten man to be your saviour, I'll agree with it. He's reflect, he's, he can do exactly what God ordains him to do. You're saved through believing in Jesus as your Savior. We're debating exactly who the nature of the Savior is, but he's the only Savior under God. God is also the only Savior. At the ultimate level, then there's Jesus, and you have other Saviors who are not going to save you from your sins, but that word Savior is a flexible term also. Then if I believe that he is God and worship him as such, am I on my way to hell? No, I don't think so, because I think you need time to look at it. Now, you may want to examine this. Uh, I don't know what you're going to do with it. I do think we're responsible for things that we hear. You better prove it one way or the other, maybe over a couple of years. That's possible. But it's such a model today, it's, it's become a little complex. I'm only suggesting another point of view. You simply pray to God. As the author of the book out there, Greg Dival did, Church of Christ, leading Church of Christ pastor, you say, Oh God, if I should be mistaken here, open my eyes. Okay. God loves you. Jesus loves you as a saviour. The fact that you haven't tangled with Greek words, I wouldn't worry about it. But think about it. See what happens. That's all. All right, we're getting to the end. I don't, it seems like more and more questions are popping up here. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, for Anthony, um, you said early on in your speech that the Jews understand God to be one and they are greatly offended when people you know, would say more. And that seems to be true because in... Uh, John 10.33 it says, The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So it seems that they clearly understood that Jesus was claiming to be God. I'm just wondering what you would say to that. Yes, you have enormous confidence in the Jews' judgment, don't you? Jesus said to them often, you don't even understand what I'm saying. They talk at cross purposes. That's possible. What does the Greek here say? Are you claiming to be Yahweh? Or you can here say, are you claiming to be Yahweh or are you claiming to be God, a God? It's totally ambiguous, you can't tell me. Nobody knows. He's claiming some enormous divine authority with which I thoroughly agree. But he answered them there. He says, haven't you seen that God can call judges gods, even human beings, even bad ones were called gods. Moses was called God. You don't run around saying you think Moses is God. Jews called Moses God, the Bible calls Moses God, calls leaders gods. So what's so difficult about Jesus then going on to explain himself? He says, is it so awful that I then, in view of the fact that even judges could be called Elohim, am I wrong since I'm the uniquely sanctified, virginally begotten, uniquely begotten son of God, to call myself, what did he say he was there in the response? The son of God. That's how he goes on record. And at the trial, the worst they could say of him was that he was claiming to be the Son of God. Every Jew knew that the Son of God wasn't God. It's not so hard. John's Gospel is being misused. Go ahead, Drew. Well, again, I think the, um, the context is why the Jews wanted to stone him. Um, he, he mentions my hand. He interchanges that with the Father's hand. And we look at Isaiah, and we see that it's God's hand who secures His people. And so, Anthony says, well, well, maybe Anthony doesn't say that, but some do say, well, maybe they just misunderstood Jesus. You know, this is what they thought doesn't mean it's true. Well, if you look at John chapter 5, verse 18, it's not the Jews saying, well, He made Himself, said He was the Son of God, making Himself equal with God. This is the divine commentary of John. This is what John says why they wanted to stone him. Because he did this. It's not what they said he did. And so I would just say that if you look at John chapter 10, he's not saying, well, you've misunderstood me. 
You see, I'm I'm sort of a God like you're called gods. I'm just a human. I'm I'm like a God like you are. I don't think he's saying that. I think they understood Jesus to be claiming to be the one who secures his people by his mighty hand. Thank you, Drew. I know Anthony you'd like to redirect on that one, but we have another question. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Uh, Anthony, the, my question is that Jesus said that the Father was spirit and that he wanted to be worshipped in the spirit. So what we have is a problem here, polytheism maybe. If God the Father is a spirit and we're supposed to worship him in the spirit, and the scripture says that we're to worship Jesus, that's two gods. So we have a problem, I think. Either we got one God that we're supposed to worship, or we got two gods. If we have two gods, the Old Testament said there's only one God, the Jews say there's only one God, so there can only be one God. Jesus Christ is God. Could you respond to that, please? Well, that makes two, as you just said. If they're both God, that's two gods. It's only when one begins to have to shuffle with language and talk about essences that you can avoid it. So I would, I would invite you to think for two years at least about that. Could the Jews have a point when they say to us, Christian Trinitarians, you believe in two gods? I say they've got a point there. We should reconsider. We might attract a lot. In fact, we are attracting Jewish believers to Christ when we tell them, you don't have to believe that Christ is God. You don't have to believe he's the Son of God. Listen, the Son of God is defined perfectly in Luke 1.35. It's all you need forever. Easy stuff. No Greek, no Hebrew. He's the Son of God precisely because of the miracle. Is it clear? Precisely. The okay, Gabriel says. Precisely because of the miracle in Mary, he'll be the Son of God. That's enough. Son of God means you're not God in the Bible, says our learned professor at Fuller Seminary. has to say it quietly. <laughs> But it's what he believes. It could be wrong, but think about that. Luke 135 is a critically important text. It defines what it means to be Son of God. Not God. But he's got equal authority with God because it's invested in him. You can call him God in a say you can. You can address him as God, as the angel of the Lord was called God, as Moses was called God in a lesser sense. He's not just a man. He's a unique example of God speaking through a man. God was in Christ, not God was Christ. Then you can avoid all of this perplexing stuff about two gods that you just told us about. It's troubling. This one's God. This one's God. Makes one God. What? Tell your children that. See if they'll buy it. A lot of children won't buy that. They're too smart. Ask them to explain the Trinity. You explain it to them. And when you've given up in hopeless confusion, you'll say, maybe there's a problem in no, I'm getting carried away. Okay, Drew, you want to respond to uh, anything in that, I guess? Briefly, well, I, I briefly. Would, I would think it would be very confusing that you have a creature being worshipped. If Jesus is just a creature, if he's just a part of God's creation, I, found it very, I find it very difficult that he's being worshipped in the same throne room of God by the same crowd and the same words are being said to him. All right, we have a cheater here, but we'll give him grace because we believe in grace. He's come back for a second question. Hold on, we got to change our disc. Go ahead. Here's our last question. Terry? Thank you. Thank you for your, letting me have another question. Um, actually, this is, this is for both of you. Um, Anthony, you can answer first. It's fine. Um, I was actually sitting down and, and just pondering over the things that were talked about and discussed tonight. One thing that kind of just popped in is you can almost call it a pearl. And, and this pearl was a, a parable a parable that the Lord gave about the wicked vine dressers. And in this parable he was talking about um, <clears throat> you know they sent different servants and then finally the owner of the land said, well, I'll send my son. Surely they'll respect him. Um, and they sent the son, and the wicked vine dress is like, oh, if we kill this guy, we can keep the vineyard because there would be no inheritance. And I, I noticed that even you, Anthony, have said that Jesus is the son. 
and Jesus is the um, sort of like the authority person that God has given divine to carry out certain tasks that he wanted done but when he was baptized he said behold this is my son and what and who could have the inheritance that God wants to give and the inheritance of divinity so how come we couldn't say that Jesus isn't God because he is his son we all in this room already agreed that he is his son and he has the inheritance of the divinity I want to say that yeah you're absolutely right I agree with all of that he was sent but that doesn't mean he pre-existed because all the prophets were sent that's a non-argument you weren't using that but I just mentioned that go to Fuller and listen to Colin Brown do your Bible study on son of God Adam was the son of God he wasn't God Israel is called the son of God he wasn't God angels are called sons of God Oh my God. Listen, if you're a son, you're begotten. It means you come into existence. Our Greek specialists here will know you now means to come into existence. God never came into existence. Eternal generation is one of these myths that's been floating around. It's said to be eternally generated. Let me give you the church fathers. He had a beginningless beginning. Did you understand that? Beginningless beginning. Yes. Did you understand it? No. We're into Greek verbiage, we're into Greek philosophy. Those guys went pretty crazy. Eternally begotten? I don't think so. Read Luke 1, read Matthew 1, you'll see when he was begotten. This day I've begotten you, Acts 13.33. I will raise up, I will produce. There it is. Even at Dead Sea Scroll it says, when God begets the Messiah, they're looking forward to it. And it's right there in, Mark, in Matthew and Luke. You don't need eternal generation. It's a meaningless term. We're playing with words then, we don't want to do that. Okay, we're back to Drew with that concluding statement. Well, I, I would agree that there was a time of beginning for the incarnation of Jesus. But the person Jesus, did he exist before his incarnation? I've, I've read several scriptures tonight about pre-existence. And so, yes, I would say that Jesus pre-existed. Uh, the parable of the vine dressers, I would say that, you know, that's probably not a good text to prove that Jesus is God, necessarily. But the way that Jesus said He was the Son of God was distinctive than what people had heard before. In other words, He would say it and He'd get stones thrown at Him. Thrown at him. So it was definitely in a unique sense that Jesus said He was the Son of God. Alright, thank you gentlemen. That's it for questioning. And that concludes our debate for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. And pray for us that we think of what else we can have on our docket to discuss. We are so blessed to have Anthony have come. What a blessing. Let's give him applause. The work that Drew did. What a blessing. I want to remind you there are materials out there. You know, you can hear something like this, and sometimes when it's new, I want to remind you, of something that's new is always hard to get in. I was talking to two uh, two young elders of another two young elders of another re religious group, and they looked at each other. They said, "Brother, I, I sense confusion here." And he said, "You know where confusion is from." And you know the the problem with with me sharing with the Mormon elders and they getting confused was that anything new is confusing. A lot of times, when you hear something new, it's confusing. We have to try to work through those things and spend the time and the energy. It's worth it to find out who Jesus is. <clears throat> I want to remind everybody, it is Saturday night. There is a time change coming up. Uh, change your clocks. I also want to ask you to please, please drive carefully on your way home. And for closing prayer, I'd like to ask Pastor David Odom to come and close, this, close out the meeting. Lord, I thank You that tonight we have perhaps spent more time in Your Word than we have at any other time. 
And that's to our shame. God, make us to become students of Your Word. Lord, it's it's hard for me to even fathom that here on November the 3rd, 2007, we're still trying to define who Jesus is. And God, I pray that we would make this a, a subject matter that we will not turn loose of. And God, I've heard a lot about changing the essence and I've heard a lot about you don't understand the Greek. But God, I do understand faith. And God, help us to sometime move from academics to faith. And God, help us to get away from religion and get into relationship. God, help us that we would, with the Apostle Paul, say that our, our only desire is to know You. The power of Your resurrection. God, help us to Get into Your Word. Study Your Word. Allow Your Holy Spirit to come alongside of us and provide interpretation for us when we in our weakness and lack of academics cannot discern the Greek or the Hebrew. God, help us through faith to trust You more. Thank You for these two who have come and stretched us tonight. God, I know that when we're stretched, we never return to our original shape. And God, we have been stretched, and I thank You for that. God, help us to find a place of worship tomorrow and be in that place of worship, honoring You and glorifying You and thanking You for who You are. In Jesus' name, Amen.